Inside Boxing Daily on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. Inside Boxing Daily is brought to you by BetDSI. You can go to BetDSI.eu, hit the promo code TGT to get a 100% cashback bonus on up to $1,000 of your first deposit. So if you deposit $1,000, You'll have $2,000 to play with. You can also go to the GruelingTruth.com page, click on the my, or Bet DSI at the top of the page, and that will take you there also. Just remember to promo code TGT. Also, Seat Giant. Get a discount on your tickets through the Grueling Truth by going to Seat Giant and putting in the promo code TGT. You see a theme here, huh? All right, there's no promo code for the Retired Boxers Foundation. But the Retired Boxers Foundation, as always, our friend Alex Ramos, Jackie Robinson, or Robinson, Jackie Robinson, yeah, Alex and Jackie Robinson run the Retired Boxers <laughs> Foundation. But Jackie Richardson, she does a great job. So does Alex. Make sure you check them out on Facebook. I am your co-host for Inside Boxing Daily, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I'd like to welcome in my co-host, Jeremiah Pricer. How you doing, Jeremiah? What's up, man? How's it going? Let's get it going. All right. What what are we going to talk about? Well, it's Andy Ruiz week here at the Grueling Truth. Um, rumors have surfaced suggesting that Anthony with Joshua may have been KO'd in sparring before he stunning downfall at the hands of Andy Ruiz Jr. Also, I heard that he might have been abducted by aliens, and then he was brought back, but he was never the same. It, I, I think this is all bullshit. What do you think? I think they're just trying to make excuses for him getting his ass beat up by Andy jo Andy Ruiz. No, I, I think it's probably all true, man. I mean, I think this is why he lost. I mean, not he was abducted. Uh, not <laughs> he was abducted. They probed him. He was him, impregnated by Mike his... Tyson on that spaceship too. <laughs> But it was not yeah, exactly. prime Mike I mean, Tyson. It, it, it all Those seemed... four months when Mike Tyson was prime, they were later on. So the kid's not as good. <laughs> I mean, it, but but it's all true. I mean, you know, make all the fun you want, but it's, you know, fact that he was knocked out in sparring. It's also a fact that he had a panic attack in, the bre in uh, his dressing room beforehand. He started hyperventilating and sobbing like a... Uh, you know, like a morning uh, really wife. Said that? I mean, no, no, not well. They did say that he. There was something going around saying that he had a panic attack in his dressing room before he came out, and that's why it took you know a while for him to get out. Uh, yeah, I, I don't really know what the hell's going on here. I mean, it just seems a bit odd, you know, that this stuff is coming out. And and honestly, uh, I got to credit Anthony Joshua. He's not confirming any of this stuff. He's pretty much just uh, he's taking it all in stride. To be honest with you, I mean, it seems like it's his fans. Not all of his fans, of course, but some of his fans that are, you know, concocting hey, these these former WBC champion. And that's hard for me to say. Frank Bruno noted on Twitter that Joshua said, why am I feeling like this during one of the rounds? Yeah, I know. It's it's funny because I thought I had a pretty clear answer when I heard that in the corner. That's he's just fatigued. He got clipped. He didn't have his legs. He's too muscle bound and he, he's tight. I mean, you, when you are a guy, in fact, when we had John Ironhoff on and we did the, the post-fight show, we noted this stuff. I mean, Joshua just has this sort of, I don't know if it's a nervous energy, but when you're that big and bulky, uh, naturally your stamina is going to sap quickly. When you're 247 pounds, which I think is a little on the big side for him, you're going to wear out quicker. He has a history of doing so for him to get clipped and then have a hard time recovering really just seems to kind of fit the bill. I mean, yeah, he's recovered in previous fights too, but it's not as if he's, I mean, we're talking about the modern heavyweights where a lot of these guys are just big. I mean, look at Vladimir Klitschko. He let Joshua off the hook and Joshua, you know, got a few rounds to recover and, the, you know, then go to, to work on his end. I mean, uh, it, it doesn't really seem like it's that surprising that he got clipped, couldn't recover, and got finished uh, again. It's, uh, you know, and when you start talking about panic attacks and, uh, you know, getting KO'd in sparring, I don't know, maybe he did get KO'd in sparring. It seems like actually, if you pay attention to everybody who said that they've knocked him out in sparring, it seems like they're a good number of these guys. I mean, I even think David Price said he knocked him out in sparring. Uh, God damn, who else? I, 
White knocked him down in the amateurs. I don't know. It seems like there's a bunch of guys who have come out. Also, I just can't recall their names. Former IBF cruiserweight champion Glenn McCrory thinks this is it for the 29-year-old. He's bottom of the pile. He got beaten up by <clears> Andy <throat> Ruiz. So I think this goes from one extreme to the other. It's just one loss. But I will say this. I think he's done because I've always thought that he wasn't very good. Just like I think Deontay Wilder is not very good. So to me, this is what it is. And it's going to happen to all or both of these guys anyways. It just happened to Joshua a little quicker than we thought. But Andy yeah. Ruiz Jr., outside, put it like this, out of everybody Deontay Wilder has beat, none of them are better than Andy Ruiz Jr. anyway. Yeah, I think you can say that now. <clears throat> I mean, after all, you know, Joshua or Ruiz beat the number one guy in the division. I mean, th- that's just what it is. And, uh, you know, when you were talking about um, uh, when we were talking about some of the uh, level of competition here and some of these guys and whether they're going to be upset. And, uh, you know, what's funny is I've seen guys pass around this idea and I understand where they're coming from. I really do. Uh, but a lot of people are like, hey, it would be nice if Emmanuel Stewart was around. And he could help reform Joshua's style. I don't want to see that at all. No. We do, let, no. Why would we want to turn Anthony Joshua into some big jab and grabber? The, listen, Vladimir yeah, Klitschko the point was be a this good too. ambassador. Why do you just want to watch him get knocked out a couple more times and then retire too? So. Exactly. Uh, exactly. I mean, uh, come on. We we don't need that. Part of the reason why the perception is is that uh, you know Vladimir Klitschko was not particularly fun to watch. I mean, even though he usually got the knockout. I mean, the dude had fifty plus knockouts. The problem was he would jab and grab you and you know wear on you until he finally reached that point where he would unload a little bit. And nobody wants to see that or nobody should want to see that from Anthony Joshua. Could he do it? Maybe. But if you listen – and another thing too is Robert McCracken's getting a lot of stuff <clears throat> for his apparent performance in, in, in their corner as well. And if you listen to McCracken, McCracken was telling him to do – Basically what, what Vladimir Klitschko was successful at, you know, just jab him from the outside, give some lateral movement and then just hold him when he gets close. I mean, it's not as if Anthony Joshua needs Emmanuel Stewart to tell him that. And again, I don't want to see that. We don't need a guy who's going to uh, potentially, you know, let's imagine that he did reform his style and that's all he was doing. He was just jabbing and grabbing guys. Nobody wants to see that take place for many, many years. It's just not the case. I prefer him as is. I mean, him being vulnerable adds a little more excitement to his career because, you know, again, he could just get upset by whomever, you know, so I think people be holding their breath, you know, watching him fight. But I prefer him as is. I prefer him. Well, I, I don't mean as is is like 247 pounds and so muscle bound. I just prefer his style as is where he likes to trade with guys a little bit more. All right, next up we got Stephen A. Smith, who is still a douche, and he proved it. This is his tweets about this fight. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I can't believe this shit. Anthony Joshua, holder of the three belts, gets TKO'd by Butterbean. I mean, some dude named Andy Ruiz Jr. What a damn disgrace. Joshua looked completely gassed, more fatigued than hurt. How in the hell did you let that happen? How? Now, number one. At different points, they put him as an expert boxing analyst. Andy Ruiz was a guy that was ranked by most people to know something, at least towards the bottom of the top ten. He'd fought Joseph Parker. He's only lost. Joseph Parker is a good, solid fighter. He lost a close decision. And the fact that Stephen A. Smith acts like this towards Andy Ruiz will tell you one of two things. Number one, he's either acting just to get people to pay attention to him, or number two, he truly knows nothing about boxing, and I think it's the part where he knows nothing about boxing, Jeremiah. I actually think it's both. I think well, he, means, he's yeah. in your face. You know, Yeah, I think I think that's his style. And it, it, it honestly irks me that that's the way sports culture has become. I mean, you get a lot of these commentators who just, they're always out there and they're always saying, you know, controversial things. I, I think the, the media outlets like it because you're getting a lot of engagement from it, whether it's positive or negative. I mean, but this is the thing is, on a personal level, I like listening to guys who are astute, you know, guys who actually know what the hell they're talking about. And again, I think the media companies, maybe this is my own theory, and maybe maybe it's bullshit, but but I guess just follow me along this this short journey. <laughs> 
I think that media companies like it because clickbait is kind of the, the lay of the land now. I mean, they want to drive engagement and they want to drive traffic and saying crap like that does both. Uh, you know, Stephen A. Smith, his boxing credentials are nothing. I mean, the, the dude follows the sport, obviously, <clears throat> lightly, because as you said, you know, Joshua is a good fighter. I mean, and he was perceived to be beforehand, too. I mean, of course, a lot of us didn't think he had much of a chance in the fight. But before he had the long layoff, I think he was as high as number seven for transnational. I could be wrong, but he was definitely in the top ten before he had that. I think it was well, a he, year he layoff. He deserved to be ranked ahead of Dominic <laughs> Brazil, and he wasn't. So that'll tell you how bad boxing is, you know, when it comes to rankings. Well, yeah, but again, well, the, the part of the problem though is is that Ruiz was was inactive for like a year, year and a half, so that contributed to his his ranking. But uh, you know, in terms of how good they are, I don't think anybody can doubt it now that Ruiz is not only better than Dominic Brazil, but he was a better option than Jarrell Miller. I actually think we we talked about this on the show last night, but. Joshua is better against bigger guys, taller guys. He just seems to have a rough go with shorter fighters. And I think there were some people who rightfully uh, pointed this out, that he was having issues with short guys like Povetkin, you know. And so, you know, I maybe we can, of course, in retrospect, it's easier, but say, hey, I mean, he's just not good with those sorts of guys. And I, I suspect that they'll probably, you know, keep him away from guys like that in the future. Granted, he can get his stuff together. But, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, for him to say stuff like this, it just really shows. I mean, and it's not even that surprising. I mean, I made the point last night that, you know, um, Anthony Joshua is not even on the level of uh, prime Vladimir Klitschko. So why should we be that surprised? I mean, people are genuinely comparing this to Buster Douglas and Mike Tyson. And Joshua is just not that caliber of a guy. And, you know, I did get some feedback on a comment that I made, you know, saying the same thing, essentially people are like, well, you know, we have to acknowledge that there are levels to it as well. You know, uh, Vladimir was knocked out by Lamont Brewster, who's, you know, maybe better than Andy Ruiz. Well, first off, maybe, but secondly, the point is, is that Ruiz can be lesser than Lamont Brewster potentially. And Joshua is lesser than Klitschko. And I think that just kind of evens the, the playing field a bit. But you know, the fact that Klitschko and Lewis were both knocked off collectively four times at or very close to their prime shows you that we shouldn't be surprised by this sort of stuff. And for Steve Yeah, but how I, about this? Klitschko and Lewis, when it happened, they were one-shot knockouts. They were kind of like fluke punches or just big punches. This was an ass-whooping basically from – round three through the end right and, and you know and i i think part of what contributed to that though was the uh you know the knockdown and the, the the first knockdown i i mean i think you could say i mean you went watch rewatch the fight i would probably have to as well but when i watched it it didn't look like he ever really recovered from that shot i mean he spent the entirety of the next round trying to recover and ruiz let, let him get away with it but i just don't think this result is as surprising as a lot of people are making it out it's certainly not as surprising as as uh no, Tyson uh, Douglas was 42 to 1. That's four times bigger just in numbers wise than this upset is. Exa and exactly. The other thing is this the importance of the fight is nowhere near Tyson Douglas because Mike Tyson was the heavyweight champion of the world at the time. In this, it was not for the heavyweight championship of the world. But I do yeah, believe this. I'm so we had this discussion last night. To me, Andrew Ruiz is number one. Because, and this is the thing, even John Einreinhofer said before this fight that he would have Joshua number one. He said that the last two years. And you, I believe, were in the same camp, as was I. Andy Ruiz beat the guy that was number one. And Andy Ruiz, his only loss was to Joseph Parker, who I think is a top five or six heavyweight without a problem. I think Joseph Parker would beat Luis Ortiz. <laughs> So you you said you think Parker would beat Ortiz? Yeah, because I think this. I think Parker <laughs> always shows up in shape. He's not going to stand there and punch it out with Ortiz. Ortiz is going to have to chase a little bit. And I think he's going to run out of gas, and Parker's going to whip his ass. Yeah, well, I don't know about that. I mean, my thing is Parker really hasn't had – I mean, he, he did good against Dillian White, and I, I think he's around that area. I think he's – 
I think he's about six or seven or so at the moment, just because he, I mean, he's, he's two and he's one and three in his last, you know, three fights. So I, I don't think he's a top five guy, but uh, I mean, it's, it's, it was a close fight and, you know, Ruiz to some people are arguably got that decision. Uh, but yeah, but that's the thing is, you know, Stephen A. Smith is reducing him to butter bean, and it, I mean, it just shows you that he's not actually watching the fights. I mean, there's no context for him other than what Andy Ruiz looks like on the outside. All right. We have a couple questions. Number one, this is from Hamed. Number one, should Joshua be fighting more than twice a year? And he, he's got more questions here, but I, I think this, and I'll answer this, and I think you agree with me. I think the reason that I find boxing boring now is I don't think the fights are as good. And I think one of the reasons they're not as good is because of inactivity. I think one or two fights a year is not enough. And if you looked at it, Muhammad Ali might throw Chuck Wepner in between a second fight with Joe Frazier and a fight with George Foreman and a Richard Dunn in there between Ron Lyle and whoever, Ken Norton. But I think the more active these guys are, I think the better fights you'll see because these guys are sharper. And I think the problem right now, and it doesn't have any, how many, I mean, he, he had under 50 amateur fights, Hamed. But the thing is this, me and Jeremiah have interviewed guys that, like George Foreman, Tim Witherspoon. These were all guys that had, I mean, George Foreman only had like 29 fights as an amateur. But the thing is, when he was coming up, he fought every couple months. And I think it does hurt when you only fight once or twice a year, Jeremiah. Yeah, absolutely. I've I've been of the opinion for a long time that uh, a lot of guys should go to the old Gennady Golovkin model when he was, you know, banging out four guys a year. I mean, it's it's it, it, that's part of how he got his name in the spotlight. I mean, this is a huge problem in boxing that you know every. Two, you know, every two times a year, you're getting the spotlight on you, and then these promoters have to find ways to get you in the spotlight longer. I mean, really, if you were just like if if Anthony Joshua was fighting, you know, the the I don't like the alphabet soup stuff, but let's just imagine he was taking two mandatories a year, and he was beating up like two top twenty five guys in between them. Or right after, right? So he would take on a mandatory, beat up a top 25 guy, do his mandatory, beat up a top 25 guy, and that was his entire year. I think he, these guys would be significantly bigger. I mean, that's it part of the reason Sergey Kovalev. Well known, everything. Ex- exactly, exactly. I mean, I mean, this is a huge problem in boxing. I mean, our superstars, if we have any of those, our superstars are just not in the spotlight nearly enough. I mean, the, this media cycle now, I mean, it seems like we've gotten backwards in so many different ways in the sport because the news cycle with boxing and all the other sports and just everything in general is 24 seven. It's constant. You know, they're always looking for tidbits. That's why you see, you know, uh, journalists comprise articles that are, you know, just Twitter feed and, or almost just Twitter feed or largely Twitter feed and stuff like that. I mean, they, they want stuff all the time. And, you know, these boxers should be giving them a lot more of that. And I, I'm definitely of the opinion that Anthony Joshua, Deontay Wilder, Tyson Fury, they should be fighting far more than they are. I would like to see four times a year, well, how about the, three, time, three times the old, I could deal with. The old adage I remember when I was growing up is really true right here, out of sight, out of mind. And when you're only fighting once or twice a year, and you're out of sight for most of the year, you're out of most people's minds. And it makes it really hard to build it. All right, another question from Hamed. Why why don't big heavyweights move their heads apart from Fury? Wilder (laughs) doesn't, and his poor head movement, and Joshua has zero head movement, likewise Joyce. But I think this, I think if you watch heavyweights, I think if you watch boxers at any level or any weight class anymore i don't think you see boxers that move their head near like they used to no well and that's that's what you see with uh 
you know, because I know a lot of the the old timers, like you, you watch Jimmy McLaurin or something, and you're like, Jesus, this guy, you know, his hand his hands are down near his waist, but yeah, that's because he could move his damn head. I mean, he could slip and roll and duck and dodge, and you know, he, I mean, he was just well rounded, and uh, you know, it probably saved energy if you were going 15 rounds as well. But I think it's a training thing. I really do. I mean, I just don't think these guys are being trained to move their head. Well, most of the time now, all they do is spend their time hitting the mitts like Floyd Mayweather does. Yeah, exactly. And funny enough, I mean, you know, Floyd had been learning to to dodge punches. Well, it's also genetics. I mean, you, you could see that it's a boxing family. But, you know, with his father, you could see that he had actually been training him uh, defensively for a long time. But I do think it's training. I think when you look at a lot of the European guys, uh, that's just kind of the way it is in the amateurs. A lot of those guys do it. I mean, you do see – you see it a little bit different for the Cubans, for instance. I mean, a lot of those guys will keep their hands low and utilize a ton of lateral movement. Um, you know, But a lot of the European guys, uh, they're just pretty upright, especially the Germans, and they just stick their hands up, and they, they like to fence you at long range. And I, I just – I really wish – well, just forget that. I really wish they would be training these guys in, you know, that form of defense. But I, that's that's where I'm going with it is I don't think they're training guys to move their head anymore. I just don't think it's – I don't think we have a lot of old timers that are in the gyms, you know, giving these guys advice anymore. Uh, I mean every once in a while you'll see a guy who's doing it or you'll have guys who are just naturally good at it and, and they just kind of adopt it as their style. But I really think it's down to the fundamental level. They're just not training it in the gyms. All right. Um, we'll move on with a little more Andy Ruiz news since it's Andy Ruiz week here on The Grilling Truth. And although Joshua and his pro- promoter, Eddie Hearn of Matchroom Boxing, of course, uh, want UK to be the spot where the rematch will take place, Ruiz had this to say. I'd love to do the rematch, but first I've got to talk to my team We'll go from there and figure things out. I'd love to be in Mexico. There's never been a heavyweight champion in Mexico, so I'd love to have a rematch there. My question is this. If you're a competitive person in nature, and you just got your ass knocked out by Andy Ruiz, and you were supposed to be the next big thing and all this, my first inclination, if I want a rematch... Is I want to rematch in L.A. or I want to rematch in Mexico. I want to come and beat your ass in front of your people. I want to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am the real deal at heavyweight. And right now, the only thing we know is the only time he's journeyed from the comforts of the U.K., he's had his ass handed to him. Now, the thing that bothers me is he's going to run back home and then the man Andy Ruiz come fight him on his home turf. I don't care what the contract said. That's bullshit. Yep, but I'm almost sure that that's what's going to happen. I but mean, he needs it's... to be a man because Anthony Joshua right now, I mean, I, I think that maybe menstrual cramps was his only problem on Saturday night. Yeah, and but... I don't like to say that about boxers because I think boxers are the baddest dudes there are. It takes a lot of balls to do that, but he needs to quit being such a bitch. I mean, he's looking for sports psychologists before the fight. He doesn't feel like training because I don't know why. Because he's got so much fucking money that he doesn't want to have to train anymore, is my guess. It's tough to maintain that body, man. So I would say this. Well, you know, you can maintain a body because as long as you lift enough weights with the steroids that you take. Not saying that he does. I'm just saying it's always possible with somebody that's built like that. Um, but by no means am I saying he's doing that. Really, I'm not. I yeah, wink, don't wink. Me, Jeremiah, but wink, I, wink. I, I <laughs> and, and when I look at this, though, I, I just don't understand why, after he gets his ass whipped, he doesn't want to prove himself once and for all. You go to Mexico and you beat Andy Ruiz's ass in front of, I don't know, 20, 30, 40,000 Mexicans. You've just proven that you can leave your comfort zone and win. If he beats Andy Ruiz at home, what the hell did he prove? Because everybody thought that he would beat Andy Ruiz to begin with. So if he beats him when he gets back home, it just looks like he was a bitch and couldn't handle it when he left home, which is true because Anthony Joshua is soft. I mean, the thing is this. That's all I see. 
With Deontay Wilder, I don't see a guy necessarily that's soft. I just see a dude that throws one big punch. If he hits you with it, he's going to win. If he misses or you can take it a little bit, he's going to lose. But right now, Anthony Joshua, to me, is turning himself into a joke. And by demanding, after losing convincingly, that he should get all the leverage here, it's horseshit, but it's boxing. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, your your old school mentality is kind of bringing itself out. I think there's something to it. I mean, I I think that Joshua would do something well for himself mentally if he traveled and then beat Ruiz convincingly. I, I, th- I think that would help him quite a bit. I mean, it, it seems like it's probably a bad thing to just, you know, have to beat guys within the comforts of your own home. And, and you know, there was a little talk of that a while back that uh, – you know, he, he didn't have any real uh, problem, you know, just kind of staying there and, and being OK. But I do think that would be good for his mental health. But I wanted to go to something that Rick Glazer said, because he, he made a long post about, you know, the contractual details and whatnot. And I think this would add a lot of context to the discussion because I'm with you. I would really like to see Anthony Joshua travel and get the win, because, I, again, I think it would help his psyche. Uh, I, I don't want him to be used to fighting in the UK all the time. Uh, even Eddie Herm understands that, you know, the big money is in the well, U.S. You'll never see Wilder Joshua again unless Wilder suffers a catastrophic <laughs> loss, too, because Anthony Joshua is no longer the A-side in any fight with Fury or Wilder. Well, yeah, and and I, you know, I think, like, you know, I think if he wants to, you know, try and become that again, because, I mean, he still will sell very well even after the loss. I mean, you know, Bruno is still a sell after this, but uh, let's let's just go to the post and let me see if I can sift through this real quick because he said he said that he saw a lot of misinformation, and I know we've talked about the contract before, but it says in the contract uh, there's an agreement that is an automatic rematch clause. So Ruiz apparently cannot sign anything other than an immediate rematch with Anthony Joshua. I don't think the location was set in stone, though, was it? Let, let's let me let me get to that because I read this earlier, but um, it says whether Ruiz gives up any titles or not, uh, he has to fight Joshua next, um, and it's at Joshua's discretion and will be promoted by Matchroom. And the site, the site will only be selected by Eddie Hearn and Anthony Joshua on the zone in America. Uh, so it says, furthermore, there is an inju- – okay, so this is word for word now. Furthermore, there is an injunctive relief clause in the agreement, and that allows Eddie Hearn to enforce the agreements in a court of law by simply asking for an injunction against Ruiz and his team – from Ruiz performing his services as a professional for fighter for anyone but Matchroom through Matchroom. So um, he has to fill, fulfill that contract. Um, okay, yep, so that's it. So he has to fight Anthony Joshua what if next. he just goes and throws the belt in the trash and goes and fights DeAndre <clears throat> Wilder? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. There's, it says there's a stipulation in there that even if he uh, – disbands the titles that he has to fight uh, Anthony Joshua next. It's nice to have, you know, to be the A side, I guess. Huh? Oh, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, and, and, you know, we, I don't, I think we should expect that they're going to fight in England, uh, you know, and, and they're going to have their way in the negotiations. I mean, uh, I, I mean, you can't blame Andy Ruiz too much because he did come in as an underdog. He, you know, they, oh, yeah, everybody... he had to do what he had to do. I don't blame exactly. him at all. Exactly. But I'm just I mean, talking he... about if the goal for Anthony Josh was to go down as an all-time great heavyweight champion or to actually be the heavyweight champion, do what champions do. I, I hear you, man. I, I'm, I agree with you. Go travel and go beat that ass. But uh, I don't think it's going to happen. But, all right, let's go ahead and we will move on to something else. Let's let's talk a little, what did I have here? All right, Tony Harrison has been injured and has, oh, real quick, we have Holy Diver, 1927, at Holy Diver, 1927. Ruiz is born and raised in U.S. What? But 
babbles on about Mexico. Do us all a favor, turn in your passport and stay there, you loser. Um, then we got Patrick Higgins who says, I doubt that Ruiz will be a champion for too long. However, since Ruiz is, ma Ruiz is managed by Heyman, we might get a heavyweight unification bout sooner, and this will be the first time since 1999. Um, all right, that's how I got Because the other one is a racist rant, so I'm going to leave that one alone. And that's from Jeremiah. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> what the hell? Like, uh, <laughs> Shit. All right. The Deeks, who's from Great Britain, says it should be Ruiz calling the shots. But it all depends on what's in the contract. <laughs> I'd be surprised mm -hmm. if Hearn doesn't get the venue he wants. All right. Yeah, he... So, yeah, that's what's going to happen. So this is going to be in the U.K. It's going to be November or December. And Andy Ruiz better knock his ass out again because a decision is not something that would go well for him. Well, yeah, because one of the one of the judges had Anthony Joshua up, and we talked about it that as well too. But and the other two that, only had him up by a point, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, so uh, yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that was going one way had it you know reached the conclusion. But I mean, uh, the the uh, who is the guy who said that uh, um, that Ruiz will probably just be a champion for a short time or a titleist? I don't remember. Okay. Yeah, I, I just I, I we we had talked about that on the show last night as I well. I think but... he could last for a little while just because the competition is not that great. Yeah, I don't think so though. I I think because I don't every he's going to be real happy and he's going to weigh two eighty in his next defense. Exactly. Yeah, we talked about this too. And when you when you add some context to the history of guys who score big upsets like this, it's not in their favor. It just really isn't unless you're Muhammad Ali and you you know you're beating Sonny Liston at twelve to one odds, and the only reason you're such a big fa uh, big underdog is because people think you're a cocky little shit. It's just a lot different than somebody like Lamont Brewster upsetting uh, Vladimir Klitschko or you know Braddock with uh, uh, Max Bear or uh, you know Douglas with Tyson. I mean Ruiz, it, just looking at his body type. It, it just doesn't look – again, I, I know yeah, – The thing that is the most comparable here is probably Buster Douglas. Yeah, exactly. Only I mean, Buster was in shape the night that he fought him, and Ruiz was even out of shape and beat Anthony Josh was ass. All yeah. right, let's move on. I'm tired of talking about this. We'll be back with more Andy Ruiz week later on in the week. Tony yeah. Harrison is injured. Jermel Charlo rematch is off. He was, uh, Harrison reportedly suffered an injury, has pulled out of the rematch against former WBC junior middleweight champion Jermel Charlo, according to Mike Coppinger. Um, the Harrison Charlo card will still be taking place on PBC on Fox June 23rd at the Mandalay Bay Hotel and Casino. Um, what do you think? Oh, nothing. I don't mean either. I don't even give a shit. If anything, let's move on. No, but <laughs> yeah. I mean, really. Because yeah, I don't care either. I mean, there's not much else boxing news to tell you the truth. So I figured I'd bring it up. Yeah, I mean, I, no, Carlo I, may I, still I, stay on the card. They're looking for a replacement. Yeah, I actually heard that they already had an opponent named. Uh, I, I don't know who the guy is, but, you know, if, if Charlo wants to stay active, I think that's a good thing. But, yeah, Harrison getting surgery, it puts off a, a fight that was, you know, seen by con seen as controversial for a lot of people. But uh, we're just going to have to wait. You know, they're just kicking the bucket, and we got to wait for it. So, All right, what do you got for on this day? On this day is, is a pretty special one, in my opinion. But, no, it's a – it's uh, Thomas Hearns upsetting uh, Virgil Hill, and we had uh, we had was interviewed. Nineteen ninety one, wasn't it? Yeah, and we had interviewed Virgil Hill a while back. Nice guy, skilled guy, one of the better light heavyweights to do it. Uh, but Thomas Hearns, I, I don't think he gets enough credit for this win. Um, I mean, Hill, you know, he's not. He's not an all-time great at 175, but he was a damn well, good fighter. His problem was the competition he fought at light heavyweight because the competition just wasn't there except for Roy Jones Jr., and by the time he got Roy, he was pretty much past his prime. Well, yeah, and some of that, too, is also uh, 
uh, we say this a lot on the show too, but some of it is also the product of their times. I mean, a lot of these, these new guys don't get the big fights because there's too many divisions and too many belts, you know? So because there was that 168 in between period, a lot of guys just could hang out there and, you know, but like never got... these are the title defenses before he fought Hearns right before Hearns. He defended his title against a guy by the name of Mike Peake, who was 9-3-2. and two. He, Let's interview that guy. Yeah, he defended his title against Tyrone Frazier, David Vetter, James Kinson, who used to be a decent fighter, Joe Lasissi, um, Bobby Chez, Willie Featherstone, Ramsey Hassan, Jean-Marie Embiid. I remember he got beat up by Marvin Johnson. Um, Leslie Stewart, who he won the title from. So the big problem was he really, going into the Hearns fight, he had never fought anything remotely resembling Tommy Hearns, and he probably never did again, except for when he fought Roy Jones or Mikhail Chevsky. Yeah, you're right. And, and Hearns was even at 175. I mean, he was a damn good fighter. I mean, you know, Hill was a damn good jabber. But Hearns was able to out jab him. He was, you know, he understood bis- distance better than Virgil Hill, and he just outboxed him. I mean, uh, I think it's pretty damn. I mean, when you put it into his- historical context, I mean, how many guys who started off at welterweight could do that at 175? I mean, you're looking at a select few. I mean, uh, uh, Mickey Walker, he was able to be successful at 175. I think he beat. Maxie Rosenblum, if I'm not mistaken, uh, he even fought for the light heavyweight title. Or maybe I'm maybe I'm mistaken there. It's been a while since I looked at Walker's resume. Uh, you know, Walker was actually able to go all the way up to heavyweight and 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 be you know somewhat successful as well. Um, but who else? Sam Langford is another guy. Well, he fought at every level, health or and was successful. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, he actually started off as a featherweight, I believe, and was successful all the way up to heavyweight. Um, Bob Fitzsimmons was as low as a welterweight when he started. He was obviously, you know, uh, real effective at one, you know, I mean, they didn't really take light heavyweight division all that serious back in his day, though he did win the light heavyweight championship. So, you know, outside that, I'm trying to think who else, Um, you know, Greb. I think Greb may have been as low as a welterweight when he first started, but it's not quite the same. I mean, you know, Hearns was a championship level fighter. He's a world class operator. Well, and the thing that struck me about the Hearns fight, the thing I remember the most was he had split with Emmanuel Stewart right before that fight because Stewart thought that he needed to retire. Oh wow! And the other thing about that fight, it was closed circuit, if I remember right, or pay per view. And Hearns made like over four million dollars, and Hill, the champion, made a million and a half. And Hill was like a—I think it was almost a three-to-one favorite going into this fight. And I, nobody really gave Hearns a chance here because Hearns was considered to be past his prime. If you look at what he did before that, you had—he lost to Iran Barkley in 1988. <clears throat> He comes back. He beats James Kenshin, but that was a close decision. He gets the draw with Sugar Ray Leonard, which he should have won. Then he beat Michael Elagide, the Silk, by a unanimous decision. He knocks out Kemper Morton. He knocks out Ken Atkins. I mean, these guys are 18-7, and 11-4 headed into it. And really, his last super middleweight fight, if I remember right, was Elagide, which he defended the WBO title, you know, which means... Uh, were for British boxing. I don't know. There's no O there, but I couldn't come up with anything. But basically, that's what they invented to get so Brits could fight for titles. Um, the Kemper Morton, Ken Atkins, I think were his first light heavyweight fights. So nobody really knew how he would react fighting Virgil Hill. And really, this was his last great performance for or because after this, so it's not like Emmanuel Stewart was way off because after this, he loses, of course, the rematch by split decision to Iran Barkley. Um, he beats Andrew Maynard, who's a good name by them, but Maynard's a guy that never really turned out to beat any, be anything. And he won some fights. He beat Nate Miller at cruiserweight. That's the other thing. He was a successful cruiserweight. Uh, lost to Uriah Grant 
which I remember, I think he got injured in that fight, because I remember watching that fight. But the interesting thing here is this is Virgil Hill and he's prime, and this is this would be like Joe Lewis beating Rocky Marciano, if that makes any sense. Not to say that either one of these guys were anything like those two, but this was Hill at his best, but I think he hadn't really been tested enough to fight Hearns, and I think that's why Hearns won the fight. Yeah, I think you're right because he just wasn't he wasn't used to it. I mean, Hearns understood the basics. Uh, you know, he understood the jabs and the left hooks, right? I mean, those I think those from what I remember, you know, I have seen the fight, but it's been a while, but yeah, I believe the jabs and the left hooks were the most effective shots that he had. And he to be honest with you, we've talked about Thomas Hearns as well and his attitude, you know, just how he even though he got knocked out, he would still come at you as if he had never hit the floor in his life, you know, and that's what he did with Hill too. He just looked confident and Hill. I just, like he said, I don't think he knew how to deal with that, that ring savvy, uh, that confidence, you know, somebody who could actually jab with him and, uh, yeah, he ended up losing a decision. I mean, it's not as if he was outgunned entirely. I mean, when I watched the fight, I'm trying to remember how I had it, like maybe eight to four for Hearn, something like well, that. I think that's what most logical people had it. Um, to me, it's been a while since I've saw it too, but from what I remember is I think Hearns pretty much controlled and dominated the first half of the fight, and then Hill got his sea legs against somebody fighting the way it was, and he did fight better in the second half of the fight. But if I remember right, I had it like 117-112 or 118-112, and the surprising thing here is Virgil Hill got closer to winning the fight on a decision than I think really des that he deserved. So, obviously, I think Virgil Hill was put in this fight to beat Tommy Hearns, get Tommy Hearns paid really well, and to be a great mark to build Virgil Hill into being something that he would never become, which was he was extremely popular in his section of the country. But outside of that, and, and that was the thing about him, and when you look at Virgil Hill's record – from what I remember of it, I mean, I'm just going off memory here because I'm not looking up the box rec right now. But from what I remember, almost all of Virgil Hill's fights up until that point were in North Dakota. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was big up there. But I, I think that Anna analysis was spot on when you said that he was, you know, he was brought in as a name to help build his resume. And they got a surprise because a lot of people view, I mean, when Emmanuel Stewart, your trainer, it's like, yeah, the writing's on the wall. You know, it's about time for you to hang them up. Uh, if your trainer is seeing that, you you can bet that people beforehand, you know, especially after being in seeing him lose to Barkley twice, you can you know, be sure as hell that a lot of fans were like, hey, you know, I don't know about this. But, yeah, I mean, it, when you look at the level of competition, like you said, that he had been fighting beforehand, I I think that's pretty I, – I just think that's right. I think they were like, okay, we got an easier target here. It's a name. Let's do this. It'll sell well. You know, it, it's it's a brand-building thing, and it, it just backfired on him. I mean, Hearns was just obviously better than what they suspected, and Hearns was excellent. I mean, they, I think it's a big win for him. I mean, because how many guys – I mean, we're, we're talking about Anthony Joshua get knocked off, and we're like, hell, we don't know if he's ever going to come back and be effective – Hearns had been knocked out a, a few times before then. And again, he acted like it had never happened, just came and got it and, you know, collected his payday. I mean, that's what I loved about Hearns. That's, that's part of the reason why he's one of my favorites. Well, and the other thing about, I, I'm looking it up now, but Virgil Hill, every title defense outside of a couple of them were in Bismarck, North Dakota. Um, he won the title against Leslie Stewart who had won the title against Donnie Lalonde, who's a friend of the show. He's been on a couple times. Um, I think Donnie, were you on with Donnie at all, or was Donnie before you? No, he was before me. Okay. We need to have Donnie on again then. But he beat Leslie Stewart in Atlantic City at the Trump Plaza Hotel. He then beat Rafino Angulo uh, in Paris to defend his title. And then he fought Ramzi Hassan in Vegas. And then we had his next 11 fights were at home in the Bismarck Civic Center. And that, I, I just think the lack of experience and the lack of really being out of his comfort zone really hurts him here because he goes 11 straight fights in North Dakota over a three year period. And then all of a sudden he's in Vegas in Z June in the hot ass weather fighting Tommy the Hitman Hearns. 
Yeah. No, I, I think you're absolutely correct. I mean, and, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, Virgil Hill had a long amateur background. He was a very good amateur. It's not the same. I mean, if you go from, you know, a real good amateur career, uh, you know, to Bismarck, North Dakota, and you're defending against that caliber of opposition, and then you're meeting Hearns. I mean, it's just, it's just, even back then, the difference between the, you know, the, the amateur game and the pro game is still, especially against a guy like Hearns, is night and day. I mean, yeah. So I, I don't think he was just able well, to cope with it. The other thing about Virgil Hill that I want to bring up is this: I, I, I gave him a knock for fighting in Bismarck, but when you get to 1996, he goes to Munich. To fight Henry Mask and actually wins a split decision against Mask, and then, you know, seven months later, he goes to Oberhausen in Germany again and fights Darius Mikulczewski. Those are two guys Roy Jones Jr. never had any interest in going to Germany to fight, and I don't think you could have paid Roy enough money to get him to go to Germany to fight them. <clears throat> yeah, that's an interesting point because a lot of people are like, oh well, you know, Roy was. Uh, he was just so perturbed by his robbery in the 88 Seoul Olympics that That's he just, you know, shit. yeah, yeah. Well, I, you, but you've heard it and yeah, you know, I've, no more shit. I, I know <laughs> I'm not, I, I'm agreeing with you, but what I'm saying is people will give that line like, Hey, you know, why would he need to travel? Yada, yada, yada. And if Virgil Hill was willing to do it and he could get a split decision against mask who we also had, um, Montel Griffin on a while back and we I asked Griffin I was like well who would win who would win if uh Mask and Mikulczewski fought and he said the real German and that was not a, necessarily a sign that that uh you know Mask was the better fighter it was just that he was the ethnic German and the judges would have given it to him and so yeah, but you, you know, know Virgil Hill won a decision exactly him. well that's that's what I'm saying I mean he was, was actually what decision but he won the decision. Yeah, but I will say so. So I th- I think you're onto something. Is that uh, he should have went over and then fought either one of these guys because well, I mean Mask at that point was n- not really a factor, but you know Mikulshelsky obviously was. So yeah, he should have went over there, or he you know they should have come to some sort of deal. Uh, but of course, with the modern game too, I can't place all the blame on. Jones, just because everybody was was slapping his ass at that time. I mean, you know, the whole WBC situation with uh, Rachiani and and some of these other guys, you know, where the uh, the WBA and who is it? The WBA and IBF stripped Mikhail Shelsky after he beat Virgil Hill because he displayed the titles alongside the WBO. And, you know, then the ring decided when they I think they changed their championship policy or they refined it around that time. And they they crowned, uh, you know, Roy Jones Jr., the champion or the ring magazine champion. Uh, so there, there was just, you know, there's a lot of outlets for these guys to avoid the big fights and and stuff like that. But Mikhail genuinely did beat Virgil Hill. Actually, that, that's the best performance of Mikhail career. I mean, he was yeah. really he was really good that night. That was the fight that made me wonder what would have happened if they'd have fought each other. I still think that Roy Jones Jr. beats him, but I'd like to see Roy go to Germany and do it because I think that is what makes fighters great. You're a world champion. You're not just like Floyd Mayweather, the champion in Vegas. You should be the champion of the world. Right. And right. the other thing is about this is after he loses to Mikulczewski, he took like a year off and he gets knocked out by a body shot against Roy Jones. And people think his career is over. And he goes, I think, to France, fights Fabrice Tiozo, and knocks Tiozo out in the first round to regain the cruiserweight title. And this is, you know, two years after. He got beat by Roy Jones Jr., and everybody thought his career was over. Well, yeah, after taking a body shot like that, I, I, I can see why people would say that. Two I mean, years that, to recover. <laughs> That, dude, that that was a legendary shot. I mean, it sounded like a damn gunshot. Um, but yeah, I mean, Tiozo was, uh, I believe, had, uh, maybe my timeline is messed up, but I'm, I'm one of the very few people on earth who's actually seen everything Mikhail Shelsky's been in. And he lost to Gonzalez. And then I think Tiozo beat Gonzalez, or maybe I'm mistaken. Or maybe, was that at Cruiserweight? Hmm. You lost me there. Yeah, hell, I'm 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 trying to figure out my timelines here. You know, I wasn't a big Tiozo fan, 
So trying to piece the puzzle together is a little. So, so you're saying Virgil Hill stopped Tio's at 175, right? Yeah, that was a no, that was cruiserweight. Okay, was cruiserweight yep, okay, title. okay, yes. So, so there we go. That makes yeah, some and sense. Yeah, Tiozo that... was pretty much done after that. I mean, he won his next six or seven fights, but he he did beat Darius Mikulczewski. Tiozo did in the mid 2000s, like 2005 or 2006. He beat Mikulczewski. It was either for, I think it was for the WBA, WBA World Light Heavyweight title. It was WBC or WB Day. But he beat him. Fabrice Tioso beat Mikulczewski in 2005. Okay, see, okay, now it makes some sense because after Mikulczewski got beat up by Gonzalez, he moved up to weight class because actually Mikulczewski, I believe he won a a fringe alphabet title i think the wbo at cruiserweight and then dropped down to 175 then you know pursued the, his career there and then after he got beat up by gonzalez he went up to fight tiozo at cruiserweight and I, i've seen that fight as well and uh yeah, tiozo was Shel- his last fight yes and and i've seen the fight he he just got beat up in that fight i mean he, he was pretty physical at 175 but against tiozo it was just he got manhandled there. Now, I, I don't think Mikulczewski ever fought at cruiserweight, though. At least I don't remember him ever fighting at cruiserweight. It, he did. He did. I don't think he did. I, I'm pretty sure that he fought at cruiserweight early in his career. Cause, oh, I'm, early I'm, in his career? Okay. Oh, maybe early in his career. <laughs> right? Well, didn't I think he went up. Okay, I think he grabbed the WBO belt. Um Early in his career. Okay, let's just yeah, figure it I, out here. I think he only had like one cruiserweight fight, though, but it was for the WBO title. Yeah, so he fought Nestor Giovanni, or I don't know what the hell. Yeah, for a, the WBO cruiserweight title in 1994, and then immediately dropped down and fought uh, Roberto Do- Uh Yeah, right afterwards. Yes. So he he was a cruiserweight briefly. Yeah, he's an underrated fighter. He beat he beat Graciano Rockjanjani also, if I, didn't he? I think he retired him. He beat Melantel Griffith. Um, Drake Dadzi was a good fighter. He beat him. Um, yeah, he had a few. He had a few. T- yeah, well, the Virgil Hill t- performance really sticks out. I mean, the Rockjanjani. Well, he beat Rockjanjani a couple times. Well, the first one he should have lost though. Well, the DQ. I mean, the, the, yeah, the first one was baloney because uh, Rajiani was muscling him around and landing hard shots on him, and he was on his way to stopping Mikulshelski. And then they, uh, then Rajiani hit him during a break, and then uh, Mikulshelski saw his out, and he, he played it off as if he was seriously fouled. He was just being a punk. I mean, Rajiani was on his way to stopping him, but then in the rematch, Mikulchelski was better. He was craftier. He had learned from his previous mistakes, and he ended up beat Rajiani up pretty good. But Rajiani looked a little bit faded at that point too. Um, yeah, but the the uh, the Hill performance is really his best. He actually had some struggles when he started fighting uh, some of the American guys, like. Um, uh, Who's the who's the southpaw Richard Richard Hall, I yeah. believe he yeah he, he had some issues with him especially in the first fight, uh, but but he, yeah he was a damn good fighter I mean he had a sharp jab you know European style but he wasn't as stiff, in fact he was kind of funny because in the Virgil Hill fight around that time he actually showed. Uh, the ability to move his head sometimes, and he looked better when he did it, but then he just kind of got real German and just stuck his hands up and muscled guys around and, you know, threw a lot of jabs and straight punches. But, yeah, all around he was a damn good fighter. I mean, uh, I mean, he, and he was the lineal, lineal champion of the world too. I mean, regardless of the what the Ring magazine said, he beat Virgil Hill, who was the man at the time. All right, Jeremiah, anything else before we wrap it up? No, I think we can leave it on that note. All right. I want to thank everybody who listened to our shows this past weekend. The numbers were huge, and we appreciate everybody that listened. If you get a chance, make sure you go rate us wherever you listen to us at. Um, also, check out Seat Download Giant. the app. Download the app. Check out Seat Giant. Um, you use promo code TGT to get a discount on your ticket purchases. Make sure you check out the Ringside Boxing Show. Or ringside Bo- well, check out the Ringside Boxing Show, too. Because 
I was going to say, make sure you check out the Retired Boxers Foundation, but we'll give a plug for the Ringside Boxing Show. Um, the Retired Boxers Foundation with Jackie Richardson and, of course, our friend Alex Ramos. Make sure you check them out on Facebook. And, of course, BetDSI. You can go to BetDSI.eu and get up to 100% bonus on your first deposit. It has to be at least $45, but you'll get, a, you'll get if you put in 45, you got 90. If you put in 1,000, you'll have 2,000. You can also go to the top of the grillingtruth.com page, click on the, my, or the Bet DSI app, I almost said the wrong thing, but the Bet DSI app, which will then take you directly to the Bet DSI website, and you'll see the grueling truth banner there with Tom Brady and I think it was LeBron James. And you hit the promo code TGT. That'll take care of that there. So we're going to wrap the show up tomorrow to share and report at 2. Tomorrow night at 11, me and Jeremiah will be back with Inside Boxing Daily. You can hear all of our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you find sports podcasts. You'll find the grueling truth. So for Jeremiah Pricer, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to the grueling truth where the legends speak.